As many fear, the coronavirus pandemic is evolving from a health care crisis into a financial one. Shuttering businesses, upending industries, and placing the livelihoods of hundreds of millions at risk. How are countries around the world coping with sudden, open, steep rises in, un in unemployment? And should we expect even more job losses this year because of the plunging global demand? Could the after effects of the pandemic be even more deadly than the virus itself? How will governments restructure their economies to cope with the economic fallout? To talk about these issues and more, I'm joined by Chi Chang from Renmin University's International Monetary Institute, Stephen Roach from Yale University's Jackson Institute of Global Affairs, and Takuchi Okubu, North Asia Director of the Economist Corporate Network. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zhou Yue. Uh, let me start with you, Professor Chu. According to uh, the National Bureau of Statistics of China, the unemployment rate reached a record 6.2% uh, in February, although it is a little bit uh, uh, slightly declined uh, from 5.9 in March. It is lower than many other countries in the meantime, but it is still a quite an impact on China's economy. Yes, indeed. Uh, we see that is impact for all the countries. Uh, China is no exception, that's for sure. But China has a very unique situation that is quite different from the rest of the world as well, we have to understand. So first of all, uh, China, well, we can say it's sad, but also lucky that the COVID-19 outbreak happened during the spring festival period of time. That is the normal period of time when most of the companies and the institutes just uh, you know, go to the vacation, go to the holidays. So at that period of time, most of the people, they will probably get rest for like two weeks or even more, like three weeks. Mm. And also that is a traditional uh, holiday for the students, the college students and you know, middle school students. Everybody is at home. So the numbers for the employment they will not be reflected very soon because we usually will collect the data after the spring festival vacation. So that gives us a leeway that uh, it, it buff away all the uh, jobless numbers. That's the first one. And secondly, we have to understand, in China, we have a lot of migrant workers. The migrant workers, they usually try to go to the city in the working season and go back to the home in the holiday seasons. So there is a time lag between they find a job and uh, they or cannot find a job. So at that time, uh, we usually started to you know, do the statistic about the real uh, employment at the end of the February or at least in the middle of the February. So the number can be a very little different from the rest of the world. Mm. And also, uh, a lot of uh, migrant workers, they are farmers part-time, also the workers part-time. So if they cannot find a job in the city, they usually go back home just to work as a farmer. So sometimes it's harder to find whether they're in the employment or they're not. So we have a little bit difference in this part. Probably that's why many Western economists say, well, the real number in China could be even higher because we don't count uh, the migrant workers. Uh, should we worry about the underestimate of the unemployment picture in China? Uh, in China, I don't think this is our major concern about employment, especially for the migrant workers. First of all, I think uh, everybody can see it with their own, uh, with their own naked, naked eyes that China is recovering its economy uh, as soon as possible. Well, for the manufacturing sectors, 90% of the factories reopened and a lot of the core industries has already been 100% fully recovered, like the energy supply and delivery businesses, uh, anything you name it. And these are very human labor intensive industries. So I think this is a good uh, news for all of us. And secondly, as I mentioned just before, the migrant workers, if they don't think the job opportunity is good in the city, so they will stay at home, they work as a farmer. And you know, in this period of time, Farming industry, especially the food supply, is a key and vital to the economy. So serving as a farmer is, uh, is actually very valuable, and mm. they can earn money out of it. But I think the true problem is happens in the service industry, like the restaurant, like the hotel. And that is something we have to worry about. So I don't think a major picture need to be worried. But still, the structural problems still need to be valued. So, so you're saying the service industry will probably uh, see the most uh, stress impact? Indeed. 
And what about That's Japan? Uh, Mr. Obukokubu, uh, Japan has also seen some uh, shedding of jobs and, and uh, also hiring has been, become very slow. What is the picture of employment in Japan? Well, uh, we, we just had an unemployment rate for March, so there was a, some deterioration, but I, so far it's very marginal. So February was 2.4, March is 2.5, so just a 0.1% rise in unemployment rate. And so far, and obviously with a national emergency, uh, many stores are closed, so there are people who, are, who have a part-time job. I think they were being laid off, so I'm sure we will see some deterioration. But then lucky thing is that uh, for, for these workers is that the Japanese, Japanese economy is actually coming off from a severe shortage of labor. So mm. the company have, are actually willing to actually keep the employment because they know it, once the economy goes, comes back, th they will actually start suffering from labor shortage problem again. So what I see is that I don't see any large company actually uh, initiating any major layoff. And uh, your, your country's auto industry has vowed to protect jobs around the world because it's one of the pillars of Japanese economy. But what measures have they put forward? So Japanese uh, government is uh, putting a lot of uh, uh, subsidy to help uh, companies keep their employment. For like a uh, small company, Japanese government is actually will be uh, providing 100% uh, of the of the re reduction in in the salary. So for larger companies, uh, Japanese government is not going to give 100%, but uh, they they will actually subsidize 75% of uh, salary uh, which are being reduced, so that uh, people can maintain the job and company can keep paying the salary. So so the the companies have in enough uh, on their uh, balance sheet to, to keep that going. Yeah, so, so far, so it really depends on how long uh, this national emergency lasts. And obviously, as you mentioned earlier, if a global economy is going to face a huge uh, recession, like a great lockdown recession in the second half, obviously Japanese export will suffer, and then there will be some consequences. So it really depends on how severe recession uh, the global economy will suffer in the second half of the 2020. And Professor Xu, uh, when we talk about employment, wh what are those people who are most vulnerable to the disruption of economic activities? Uh, we understand that some people uh, here in China do not enjoy the same social uh, security benefits as others. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you make of the disparity of, of uh, the benefits? Well, in China, I think the most vulnerable group under the outbreak of the COVID-19 is the migrant workers who work in the service industry. I just mentioned, if you are uh, a waitress in a restaurant, if you work in for the hotel, and at this point of time, I think it's the hardest moment for you to just to get a paycheck. In Chinese rural area, you have to understand lifestyle in there. Uh, livelihood is not a problem for sure because uh, in China every farmer was entitled were entitled with one of the uh, piece of land so you can always uh, plant crops in there so vegetables fruit and everything and uh, rice is not a problem I have relatives who live in a rural area so food is not a problem but the thing is they need cash and they need cash to buy medicines they need cash for you know study materials and other expenses which is hard for them to get under these circumstances. So I think government is really stepping out to provide support for them. Right now in China, many cities and uh, provinces, they started to issue uh, the stimulus coupon, which is for the consumption. Mm -hmm. And also they have the uh, protection package of the finance, which means to give, uh, the, uh, give the renminbi or give the cash uh, to the vul real vulnerable families. If you can really prove yourself or register to the poor family, you can get the cash. Uh, well, this is very similar to most of the uh, world are doing. And also China is, you know, the most important thing is trying to understand the root of employment is still we have to get the restaurant, get the hotel back on live, get them back online. So the Chinese government is really kicking in a huge amount of loans and a targeted uh, support and subsidies to the service industries. So only by the employer can get alive and then I think the employees will go back on the jobs. As you said, uh, the government uh, at the central and the local levels have been 
uh, trying to stage different policies, uh, as you mentioned, uh, tax breaks, uh, rent subsidies, lower employer contributions to pension and insurance. Uh, but do you think these policies are good enough to provide a good business? businesses for, for, for the country because a, as you mentioned those services industries are heavily impacted because there is a low demand. That's true. So I think the top priority as Chinese government I mentioned is right, to get people's life back to normal. Not only to you know recover the supply but also to recover the demand. So the government is right right now issuing a lot of the guidance to help people to get back to their demand, get back to the shopping mall restaurant in a very safe manner. This is for one thing. And secondly, China is really issuing a lot of a structural or targeted loans to the service industries. For one thing you have to understand, service industry, especially the on-site service industry like the restaurant, the movie theaters, is not the core part of the GDP. In the past, if we want to maintain the speed of the GDP, we just, we just invest a lot of money into you know, the heavy industries or the infrastructures, but that did not create many jobs. In order to protect the people's livelihood, we better secure the job in the service industry, which is not a big part of our you know, GDP. So this is very different thinking. So this target alone is helping this uh, restaurant and industries and uh, like hotels. So uh, we're trying to get people back to job. But mm. also we have to understand, we need to make the target. This is a very important word. And uh, some just a small restaurant sometimes decide to take the loan and Probably I should try my luck in the, in the housing industry or we should try mm. my luck in the stock market. Then what happened? So uh, I think Chinese government is doing it really in a precautious way. We try to step forward, you know, very gradually and very stably. We don't want any turbulence to occur. So I think this is something very special in China. And Takuji, I think the Japanese service industry is uh, facing the same problem. How can the government help? if there is a low demand and there are safety concerns about whether we should open businesses at all. Right. So, well, it is actually Japanese government policy that uh, we are not implementing lockdown, period. No soft lockdown, no hard lockdown. Japanese government seems to have a op be of the opinion that uh, surgical adjustment, so closing down some high-risk uh, entertainment restaurants, uh, you know, where there's some physical contact, you know, uh, between clients and uh, the uh, hostesses. Um, I think uh, closing down those risky restaurants should be good enough. So Japanese government is actually allowing restaurants to keep uh, operating. Yes, it's until 8 p.m. for now, but mm. uh, we actually seeing some sign that uh, the COVID-19 spread is actually already starting to slow down. Okay. And I think there's actually a good chance there's a good chance that the Japanese government may uh, relax some uh, restriction uh, come May 6th. So I think so far the economic impact on Japan is not that great. And, and Professor Chu, uh, uh, of course the annual GDP target is a big thing for China. But recently uh, Premier Li said that it is not a big deal whether the growth rate is higher or lower this year as long as the job market is stable. It seems to suggest that we don't care so much about GDP growth, but we worry about the job market. Uh, w w what is your forecast of the uh, employment picture throughout the year? Uh, well, I think well, we're going to look into a very different evaluation system this year. Uh, this is a very special time for all of the world. Uh, I think Premier Li is really uh, wise and smart by mentioning this. Well, if we want to give everybody a confidence by just boosting the numbers of the GDP, that's an easy job. Trust me, that's very easy. You just to build another subway or build another 10 well, highways or just to build high-speed rail, and the GDP will grow up immediately. But that doesn't create many jobs. Probably you only need like 4,000 people or 40,000 people just for to do the construction job. Mm. That's very easy. So. As I mentioned, because the railways, the highways are a real part of the GDP, the hard course. But sometimes we're facing that probably the restaurant and the movie theater is only uh, consists of well, like 9% or 10% of the Chinese GDP, really small part. And probably they're providing like 2 million people to job. So we're having a trade off here. Do you want to secure the GDP numbers or do you want to have 2 million people have their better life or stable life during this uh, special period of time? I think the government is making the right choice to secure people's job and their livelihood. Mm. So um, 
by this period of time, the government is really using all the money they have to boosting into the consumption area, not like before, it's just try to drive up the, uh, the infrastructures. I think this is pretty wise. I think most of the countries like the USA, like uh, UK and Japan, they're doing the similar things. I think everybody understands this point. Only with people with their job and the country with the future. And what, what, what is also challenging is that China is moving uh, away from relying too much on manufacturing towards services and consumption. And now the COVID-19 hits us. Is it a good thing or a bad thing for the restructuring of the Chinese economy? Uh, well, I, I think it's hard to say. Uh, for example, actually during the outbreak of the COVID-19, everybody actually realized it's very important to develop manufacturing, to see the flexibility of the Chinese manufacturing. The BYD, one of the automobile makers, they just switched their assembly line to build the, the medical masks within just one week. Now the production volume is two, uh, 30, uh, 30 million pieces a day. That is huge. So everybody understand only with the power to make the real things to help the people can a country survive. But also people understand the importance of the service industries and also the flexibilities of the service industries. People's demand will not uh, vanish very soon because it's our habit. But we can change uh, the form of our habit. For example, you like uh, good food and now you can have the delivery of the good food. Mm. You like to hang out with your people and now we have an online meeting, right? So we reshaped our service industry and a manufacturing industry, but we do not trade off one to another. So this is the lesson we've learned. Uh, and also, uh, Takuchi, uh, what, what is the Japanese government's uh, plan to deal with the uh, impact? Because uh, we understand that Prime Minister Abe has been uh, an economy first uh, prime minister, and his economics has been dubbed as Abenomics. Does he plan mm, to mm. come up with more physical uh, stimulus packages? Right. So, so far, I, I think Japanese government is kind of focusing on uh, uh, containing uh, COVID-19, but they did o already come up with a very large, super large stimulus worth more than 20% of uh, GDP. So that's sizable. Uh, but obviously, I think Japanese government's uh, uh, po uh, uh, sent, uh, direction is we need to contain it. You know, while we are in national emergency, there's just no point, you know, giving uh, money uh, because they're not going to spend. You know, they can't. Uh, they are. They're trying to stay indoors. So they. So I think the plan is contain it first, and then once the containment is uh, confirmed, well, there'll be a money handouts. There'll be uh, some uh, subsidy for tourism. So that uh, it will come in uh, two stages. And we understand that Japanese economy is already written with a lot of debt. Can, can Abe's government uh, put up with more, more debt uh, down the road? As you said, there will be more physical stimulus. Right. So it is a controversial issue, but actually Bank of Japan just announced yesterday they're actually willing to buy a Japanese government bond without any limit. So uh, in that sense, uh, Japanese government is basically uh, printing money, and uh, it is a controversial policy, but then so far the market is actually very calm, and interest rates on uh, Japanese government bond is uh, pretty much zero. So in, in terms of a market reaction, market seems okay that the Bank of Japan is basically bankrolling Japanese government finance. And, and also uh, about the global value chain, many people say, uh, that the industrial value chain in East Asia are very closely linked. That means China, South Korea, and Japan are, are very dependent on each other uh, for the output. Uh, how much disruption mm -hmm. have you seen? So, so far, uh, not much. Uh, we, we, only, uh, we are probably seeing very relatively mild uh, disruption for March. And then I do hear more sign of a bigger disruption in April. For example, like car companies are pretty much uh, stopping their production line. So, but then I would say compared to what Japan experienced in the Lehman shock, you know, Japanese in, in after the Lehman shock in three months, Japanese export declined by 50 percent. Mm. You know, yeah, so, so, so compared to that, uh, Japan is not experiencing that kind of a severe shock. Um, so, uh, you know, banking system is fine. Uh, so, uh, in the Lehman shock, Japanese uh, GDP declined by 6%. So, 
So we are, yes, expecting a decline this time around, uh, around 2% decline. But in, uh, as far as Japan is concerned, we are actually mm. expecting smaller shock okay. than we, what happened in the Lehman shock. Let's turn to the United States. Uh, we have Stephen Roach on the line. And Stephen, uh, the unemployment in U.S. peaked at 15 million following the 2008 financial crisis. And in the past weeks, uh, five weeks, 26 million Americans have filed jobless claims. Uh, there are concerns that this is an unprecedented level of unemployment probably since Great Depression in 1933. How serious is unemployment in America? Well, look, it's, it's very serious. The unemployment rate is um, uh, going to uh, go up very sharply in numbers that will be reported on May the 8th. The, um, the April number could be somewhere around 15 percent, and it, it certainly could be headed um, considerably higher in the months ahead. The question, though, is uh, whether or not this is a temporary spike that mm -hmm. will be followed by uh, a significant improvement or whether or not this portends a lasting period of sharply elevated uh, depression-like unemployment in the United States. What is your opinion? Because uh, many people believe there will be a very strong and quick recovery after uh, the COVID-19 uh, chapter is over. Look, I, I think that um, the experience in China is instructive for those of us in the U.S. You've been very successful in stimulating employment and in production, but far less successful in stimulating demand by socially distanced consumers who remain fearful of participating uh, in um, uh, outward-facing uh, public service activities like eating out shopping and travel and leisure yeah. and just as your demand side is weak our demand side will be weak as well and so i think that applies both to the u.s and the chinese economy and your economy is a little bit different from the chinese uh service industries cover a larger part of your economy so how different uh, will your economy uh, respond to uh, the, the the closure and the, the, the shutdown well, that's entirely correct. Uh, we have a much higher service-based economy uh, than you and China do, so this will have uh, a, a more significant impact immediately. But I would point out to you that if you look at the growth uh, in uh, Chinese GDP over the last 10 years, the biggest engine of growth by sector has been the tertiary or services sector. Mm. So to the extent that you have relied much more on the expansion of services uh, than we have. This has a big impact on Chinese growth as well. And President Trump has been pushing for some governors to reopen their states and businesses. Uh, with confirmed cases still rising quickly, um, more than a million cases in the U.S., do you believe it is a right time to open up? Well, look, I, I'm not the, um, the scientist or the epidemiologist who can make that judgment. Uh, I do worry that we're um, uh, letting our American impatience uh, take precedent over uh, science and more cautious public health policy. And um, uh, the only thing that's worked to um, so-called bend the curve in the United States has been social distancing, and if we take that away prematurely, the virus, which has been here all along, will uh, uh, continue to infect and potentially uh, at a higher rate again. So I, I'm quite concerned. I've been locked uh, and that will be a second weeks. wave of I'd economic impact. Well, if, if, if the virus uh, were to, to come back, then uh, we have to increase lockdowns again, and, and yeah, there, there'd be... Uh, multiple waves of economic impact and that would be mm. very disturbing for the economy. And last, let's turn to have a look at what the, some of the chatters about the uh, reopening of the economy in the U.S. Uh, uh, the, some social media u users have been saying all these reopen protests are about one thing, getting poor people disqualified for unemployment. That's it. That's the end game. 
that's what this is all about. So uh, it seems uh, he's uh, suggesting that this, uh, this COVID-19 epidemic has also laid bare the problems of inequality of opportunities in the United States. W what do you make of this problem, Mr. Roach? Well, well, you know, please don't give any airtime to ridiculous social media chatter like that. <laughs> I think we do have we do have serious problems about um, uh, inequality, and it's very clear that if you look at the incidence of COVID-19 by income group, by by racial group, uh, that those individuals who have been suffering from lack of high quality health care and who have limited access to uh, being able to uh, manage the, the actual luxury of staying at home, uh, they're going to be uh, hurt the most. And that is exactly what's happened mm. uh, in our uh, country and probably is happening similarly in other countries as well. The disadvantaged always get hurt uh, the most by catastrophic developments. And Mr. Roach, I know that in your latest article, you said that there is going to be a major rupture in China-U.S. relationship is at hand. And recently, Political uh, Magazine has revealed a 57-page memo authored by Republican strategies advising uh, the GOP candidates to address the coronavirus crises by attacking China. It includes advice on everything from how to tie the Democratic candidates to the Chinese government and how to deal with accusations of racism. Obviously, uh, the COVID-19 has uh, dealt a shock to the relationship between China and the U.S. What do you think is the fundamental problems? Can the two countries still cooperate? No, certainly not between now and uh, the, the, the next, the upcoming election. But, but let's not put this all on uh, the pandemic. The relationship has, has been a troubled relationship now for about three years. We've gone from a trade war to a coronavirus war. And uh, with the, the political strategy uh, taking dead aim on China uh, and drawing support, I might add, from uh, public polls, the Pew Research poll showed bipartisan uh, animosity building at record levels against China uh, uh, in the early months of this year. Uh, the politicians smell blood in the water uh, they don't want to accept any responsibility for problems they may cause, so it's very convenient to mm. find a scapegoat and blame someone and, else, and that's China. And, and considering this, is this is election year, this will make this, uh, uh, this tactics more appealing for politicians. This will uh, quite conceivably be, uh, if not the biggest issue, the top, one of the top two or three issues in the upcoming presidential campaign. But what about the economic relationship? Will the two countries, as many suspected, would really decouple because the Americans worry about the uh, economic link between the two? Look, I've, I've been uh, working on the economic relationship of U.S. and China for 15 years, and uh, I've never been more negative than I am right now. We need China. We're dependent on China for low-cost goods. We're dependent on China for growth in our export business. And we're dependent on China uh, as a major source of uh, purchasing our treasuries. But Americans don't seem to care, neither do political leaders, and so they're willing to mm -hmm. go it alone. And that would, I think, pose good, uh, great risk to the U.S. All right. Thank you very much. We're running out of time. Thank you, Mr. Roach, and thank you, Mr. Okubu, for your insights. You've been watching Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm Dylan Bacon. Goodbye.